Okay, my friends, Roger Spur, Mud Fossil University, and I am going to explain to you quantum mechanics very simply, but you have to start off from understanding the nucleus is not what they say. And I'm going to show you the nucleus right now. This is Brusspup. 2.8 million subscribers, 18 million hits on this. And what are we looking at? This is what is considered to be the salt experiment. And what they have is a table here that vibrates with resonance frequencies. And all that is is, is buzzing the electrons in this plate up and down at a certain number of cycles per second. Bzzz. Now, what happens as those cycles get faster and faster? You get bigger and bigger molecules, or, or atoms, literally. Now, I'm, I'm not kidding you. This is what the actual particles of an atom nucleus look like. We're going to be looking at nucleuses. And the nucleus is the center of an atom, and then around that is electrons. Yes, I'm 100% with that. But the nucleus is not protons and neutrons. It is all made of electrons. And every one of these is an electron. Now watch what happens as we hit 345 shakes per second. Watch this. That's Hertz. Here it goes. And it's going to be shaking. Zzz, bang! It locks in. And what is that? That is literally the smallest period, I mean a group, on the periodic table. The smallest group is hydrogen and helium. And all that has is a tiny, tiny core of one big ball of electrons that can have up to four or so electrons, which is helium. Helium normally has two, but it can have up to four surrounding the nucleus which the nucleus is nothing more than this ball. Once you get past the first group into the second group, you're into what they call the rule of eight. So instead of having one core in the center, you're going to have eight cores around it. And here's what happens. Watch. As it goes up to the next frequency, this is the locked in on all those little electrons. Now, the next one, you end up with the rule of eight. We're at 1033. Watch. Bang. What do you have now? You have the core, which is nothing more than a whole batch of electrons this time, not just the little ones down here. This is 1,840 or so electrons. This is 7,352 electrons, approximately. This Now you're up into tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of just particles like this in the center. And now you have eight of these little particles around here, one here, one here, one here, one here, they, they're all over like that. And they surround the core. So that's called the rule of eight. Now, this is the simplest of the rule of eight. So this might be somewhere down in this range, carbon or nitrogen or oxygen or something. Now, uh, well, let's go to the next one. Well, let's go way up. And there's no sense going through each one of them because, I'll, well, I'll show you one here and there. You see, every time they get to a big higher frequency, they get more and more complex. But they still create these patterns. And you'll always be able to find the rule of eight if you look carefully. You know, like one, two, three, four, five, I don't know. There, there's, a, there's eights around here somewhere. But it would, my point being is you, you have a pattern that is so regular and it's due to the fact that each one of these particles, because these are salt, and salt is nothing more than a bar magnet, NaCl. That's the one-sided periodic chart which has virtually no extra electrons, and this is the side that has all the extra electrons, so you have a bar magnet. These bar magnets push it back and forth to each other because of the frequency, and then at a certain frequency they say, okay, I'm good with you, you're good with me, yeah, we're good. Everybody else good? We're good. Boom! Lock in. And that makes a bigger and 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 bigger molecule, or uh, atom. And then atoms hook together like this, you have two of these like this, and they say, well, you give me a couple of your, your extra electrons, I'll give you a couple of mine, and we'll hook together, and then we'll be stable like that. And it's okay, that's good, I can do that. And uh, that's what happens. On their own, they are 
there, no, nothing here is really stable except for when you get down here in these stable gases because they have a full complement of electrons. These always want more electrons and these always want to get rid of electrons. So you, they, they bind together. And this is where you have, this is life right here. This is our blood. Literally, that's your blood right there. Transition metal complexes. They move everything back and forth through your body, primarily using iron mostly. And, but they, they add and give and take and so forth because they can transition. They transition the molecules back and forth. I love this stuff. <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. I just can't help myself. But this is what, and then you, when you get up to these particles way up here in your uranium and plutonium and stuff, they're so big, they don't want to be together. They say, let me away from each other. And they decay. It's called nuclear decay. They fall apart. They shoot off particles. And they say, let's get a little smaller. We're just too heavy. We're way too heavy. Now, what they do with a, an atomic bomb is they get all of these big, 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 gigantic particles that don't want to be together in the first place. And then they put bombs around them force them to go together and everything goes apart. And when they go apart, instead of one little particle going like light does, they go apart in chunks like this, like hand grenades. And, and everything that they hit, they just vaporize. That's what vaporization is because of these gigantic particles smashing through every other gigantic particle and it vaporizes it. And vaporizing is nothing more than hitting this thing so hard that it just splashes like a splash of water throwing particles everywhere, flying everywhere. And we have done that. Okay, we just talked about nuclear fission, which means breaking them into little bits and big chunks. It depends on what you started with. We created fission from light, so we created the tiniest particles you can make. However, if you start from plutonium and break it, you've got chunks that are like basketballs going all over. Now, fusion, totally opposite. You don't break it, you crush it. And all spinning bodies in the universe are spinning through other particles, forcing them to crush. And eventually they crush more and more and more and more. And the sun is in that situation. The more it gets crushed, the more it emits its particles of light. That's all it is. Fusion means you take a one big chunk and you force it into another one, and when you do, you release a lot of little electrons and so forth. So you release a lot of light. It's, it's light particles, basically. You're not releasing big bombs uh, uh, normally. It's normally going to be a flow of light coming off of the fusion events, and that's what we get from the sun. So that's all there is to it. I think it's pretty obvious now that electron flood theory is what works. And I want to show you something about the corona and about our solar atmosphere, which will seal the deal. All right, there's an atomic bomb going off. The reason you have these vapor layers here is because the particles are coming out of here, smashing all of the atoms that are in the atmosphere, which are water molecules primarily, and that's what causes this push to shove, and you're going to boom, 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 you got like three or four layers of atmosphere that just concuss and glow like that. And of course there's the atomic bomb, and the particles coming out of it, the fission throws them everywhere, and that excites all of these and makes them vaporize and glow. Now. Now this just absolutely seals the deal. Out here, whoops, out here around the sun where the corona is, it's millions of degrees. On the sun it's only 7,000 degrees. The reason it's millions out here because it's scrubbing the particles trying to get away against the particles out here trying that are filling the, the universe with light particles. I mean, that's all there is, is light particles. They're everywhere. And we are scrubbing through them as well. As our particles scrub on our atmosphere, 
to the particles that are in space, it heats the hell out of our ionosphere. 2,700 degrees out there. Why is it so hot out there? And only 100 or so on the surface tops, or not tops anymore. But it's it's getting hotter than it's going to ever, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter on the surface. I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, because we're scrubbing. It's not that the carbon dioxide is forcing the, the heats to stay in, it's that we're scrubbing and harder and harder and harder. As we fill up our, our envelope, our balloon, bigger and bigger and bigger with gases, yes, it's going to scrub harder and harder, no question. More and more turbulence, more and more hurricanes and reactions in the atmosphere, no question whatsoever. But how do we reverse that? Just by getting rid of carbon dioxide, I don't think it's going to happen as a reversal, but we should at least take a look at electron flood theory and try to utilize free energy, because we can have free energy literally within a couple of weeks. If somebody just pay some attention, please.